be looking at abstraction in art or the power of unreality. How artists choose to represent the world in a way that doesn't necessarily correspond to a strict representation of what our eyes see. Now, because abstraction is often a difficult or touchy subject, especially in modern art, let's start off with an exercise. What is a work of art that you have had a difficult time relating to because of its degree of abstraction? What in particular about the artwork did you find frustrating? So abstraction in art is artworks that don't attempt to represent an accurate depiction of a visual reality, but instead use shapes, colors, forms, geometry, or gestural marks to achieve that effect. Now let's start this off by saying that abstraction in art is not a new thing. In fact, it is probably the oldest convention of art. Humans have been using symbols to represent more complex shapes and ideas since before recorded history, and cultures across the world embrace abstraction, as we have seen in many of our lessons. You may recall the tribal masks in Africa that use abstracted imagery to recall characteristics of certain animals. So those very simplified shapes can be used to recall the strength and warrior spirit of the ram. In Japan, the calligraphic lines of ink wash paintings become so simplified that they blur the lines between representations of reality and abstractions. Textiles and wearable art especially use abstraction to tell stories or to communicate specific roles or ceremonies. We've looked at the kente cloth in Africa, but Native American beading also used wampum made from shells to create abstract symbols that told a story. We've already looked at the Hiawatha belt in its broader context of Native American art, but today I want to look at the specific story that is being told through the use of abstracted imagery in this work. So this pattern right here that you are looking at is the national belt of the Haudenosaunee. It is named after Hiawatha, who was considered to be the peacemaker's helper. In this belt is a record of the five nations, the Seneca, Cayuga, Onondaga, Oneida, and the Mohawk, when they buried their weapons of war to live in peace. Each square that you see on this is a representation of a nation. And the line that connects each nation is a connection that represents their desire for peace. The center symbol represents the Onondaga tribe who created this. It was with the Onondaga that Hiawatha the Peacemaker planted the Tree of Peace. Under this tree, the leaders buried their weapons of war beneath it. Then the peacemaker set forth a method for the Haudenosaunee to gather as one to think about their decisions concerning the Haudenosaunee. The peacemaker set the council fire at Onondaga, and at Onondaga is where the nation's leaders meet. This belt was created when the Haudenosaunee was formed, and this unification of the tribes occurred before the first Europeans even came to Turtle Island. And so you see in this example imagery that has been simplified and abstracted to suit the medium, which is the modular medium of beads that only appear in one of two colors to convey important messages and a story. And there are many examples in historical and non-Western art of people using abstraction to successfully communicate ideas but in the context of today's lesson, we are going to be looking at some of the more notorious uses of abstraction in Western culture and examining why things got to be that way in the first place. So in art, you can basically have representation and you can have abstraction. Here are examples of each from different periods within the modern era. Representation duplicates what you find in the natural world. Representation seeks to copy reality. Abstraction, on the other hand, is either an adherence to geometrical shapes and forms as a stand-in for organic or representational objects, or it's a record of artistic gestures that are not intended to copy anything you find in nature. 
And this all begins with this image right here, the first ever photograph taken by a human. Now, as you will recall from our look at Impressionist painters and during that lesson on time, the camera changed everything for the art world. Before photography, the only way to record how something looked was to get a skilled artisan to make their best copy of that person or place. But as the technology of photography improved and became more and more accessible over the coming decades, photography began to replace painting or sculpture as the primary source of documentation. Photography also changed the way that people perceived the world around them. James Clerk Maxwell, a scientist and a physicist who developed the first durable color photograph, was a key figure in the establishment of theories of the principles of light as a wavelength and that property of light being responsible for the way that we see the world. When the camera removed the necessity of artists and their labor to create strict documentation of the world around them, the role of the artist suddenly became a lot freer. As we will be discussing in more depth in modernity, artists over the next century realized that they could never compete with the quickness or detail of photography. So they shifted towards new goals, ones that machines could not replicate so easily. Impressionists became obsessed with the quality of light or capturing that impression of the fleeting moment. Pablo Picasso, one of the founders of Cubism, was heavily influenced by the shift from the focus of art being what the artist sees to what the artist feels about what they see. And he became more and more interested in abstracting shape and form. And as I have said before, this is a huge shift from representation, a reflection of the outside world, something that represents what we see, to abstraction, less about what objects look like and more about what they symbolically represent, a window to the interior. The Cubist movement openly rejected perspective, which had dominated art since it was a thing in the Renaissance. Instead of seeking to create an illusion of space, Cubists broke down the world around them into shapes. This included multiple perspectives within one plane, and it blurred the separation of foreground and background. So, goodbye with representation, and hello to abstraction. The inspiration for the radical shift towards more geometric and stylized representation of figures, again, actually comes from Picasso and other influential artists' interest in quote-unquote primitive arts like African masks. Two of the figures in this painting are actually being represented wearing some of those African masks. What we are seeing in the geometric abstraction of modern art is really a Western interpretation of forms created by non-Western cultures. So just as Art Nouveau was heavily indebted to Japanese art, especially the Yu-Gi-Oh!, Cubism largely stemmed from African inspiration. Influenced by the Surrealists and the Cubists who came before them, the abstract expressionists sought to capture strong emotions on the canvas. So rather than relying on imagery as a surrealist or a cubist might, an abstract expressionist was trying to convey emotion only through the material that they were using. They wanted the paint itself to be the star the main mode of communicating messages or emotions. And in a way, this represents a massive crisis that is going on in the art world, a realization brought on by World War I that a lot of the constructs that we build for ourselves are in fact arbitrary and built on a foundation of illusions. Artists will handle this crisis in different ways. Consider how surrealists would use puns and visual metaphors to challenge the very idea of what a painting is. Here, the artist Magritte claims, this is not a pipe. Ceci n'est pas un pipe. And it's not. It's a painting of a pipe. That is something that's very different. You cannot smoke with the painting. And in a way, the pipe that you think that you are looking at very much does not exist. 
Abstraction is an equally radical rejection of falseness in the art world. For abstract expressionist, abstraction lets art be exactly what it is, paint on a canvas. The challenge for them then was, can you create emotional connections and a powerful experience without attempting to connect to the representational world? And the abstract expressionists are not united by a common aesthetic as the cubists might have been, or maybe like painters of the Rococo era, where you can look at a Rococo painting and based on the style, you know that's what it is. Rather, the abstract expressionists are unified by the philosophy of truth in abstraction. Here we have two images that take very different visual approaches to abstract art. Rothko, in his color field paintings, sought to convey a feeling of spirituality and transcendence by creating large areas of color that modulate as they go along on the canvas. He would meticulously layer translucent coats of paint over each other to achieve specific colors with depth in person. So in person with a huge canvas, and both of these paintings are quite huge, much taller than human height, the intended effect was to overwhelm the viewer through the use of paint alone without the distraction of imagery. Jackson Pollock, on the other hand, wanted his work to be a record of action, hence the term action painting for his work. So you see the completely unrefined gestural strokes that come from the swinging of his arms in space and how those strokes translate a sense of unrefined energy. So abstraction in his case meant creating a field of energy that spoke to the movement of the artist and his ability to affect and transform the canvas. The splatters on a canvas are records of his movements and painting for him is a verb rather than just a noun. Click on the link to watch this video by the nerd writer about how abstraction came to be. You're going to hear some of the same things we've already been talking about in this lesson, but you're also going to gain some new perspectives in the history of abstraction in art. And when you come back, we will end with this practice analysis. I want you to give me an analysis of this abstract painting without reference to anything representational. So when you are doing this analysis, I want you to only use your elements and your principles as your guide, not trying to connect this to another artwork or to another period in history, but simply how is Franz Klein in this work using the most basic qualities of the elements and principles of art to convey some sort of mood feeling, message, or emotion in the piece.